This video is brought to you by my lovely patrons Thomas Johnson, Lewis, John Mezzo, Henry Kerr, Mike Ran, Kevin Strauss, Rudbot, Tom Smarty, and a special thanks to ARW, James Rapp, and newcomer Miriam H for their contribution to today's video. For as little as 3 Australian dollars a month, you can get your name shouted out at the start of every Sawman video, as well as access to bonus behind the scenes content. Link in the description below. I'm going to preface this video with the knowledge that I really don't like Tony Abbott. In fact, it was his three years of terrible leadership from 2013 to 2015 that pushed me to get into politics and destroy the notion that all politicians are the same, because some are much, much worse. To detail why I say that, let's put our 28th Prime Minister in the spotlight. Anthony John Abbott was born in London, England in 1957. He would move to Australia in the 1960s and settle in Sydney, where he would complete his studies up until his graduation. After getting a Bachelor of Education at Sydney University, Abbott would move to the Queen's College in Oxford, where he would complete another Bachelor in Philosophy, Politics and Economics. It was during this time that Abbott would become very politically active, becoming a strong voice against the more progressive stance of the uni student leadership. Moving back to Australia in the 1980s, Abbott would briefly consider joining the priesthood, as well as a career in journalism, but would end up settling into politics. He would, ironically, briefly consider joining the Labour Party, after being encouraged by future Premier Bob Carr. However, Abbott would refuse due to disagreements with the amount of power unions held over the party, and instead became press secretary to Liberal leader John Houston, and would help write the infamous Fight Back policy. In 1994, Abbott would renounce his British citizenship to enter politics by winning the seat of Warringah off the retiring Michael McKellar. Following Howard's 1996 landslide win, he would work his way up the cabinet and would somewhat make a name for himself, most notably by being a major player in the monarchist opposition to the 1990 Republic referendum. Abbott would also generate some controversy during this time when he created a trust fund with the purpose of undermining the One Nation Party via some dubious methods. Arguably Abbott's biggest controversy would come during the 2007 election campaign when, as Health Minister, he was very dismissive of the terminally ill Bernie Banton, an anti-asbestos campaigner. Following the 2007 election, Abbott would find himself in opposition, where he would attempt to become party leader but would fail first to Brendan Nelson and second to Malcolm Turnbull. Abbott would eventually get his turn when Turnbull announced he planned to support Kevin Rudd on his admissions trading scheme. Abbott would challenge Turnbull over this move in what in my opinion was the nation's first move into killing any form of effective climate change policy. By taking down Turnbull and positioning the coalition against the ETS, Abbott had turned climate change into a partisan issue, which it still remains the case today. Destroying bipartisan policy on climate change wasn't Abbott's only terrible move in opposition, as, following Gillard's assumption of the role as PM, he would tie with some pretty vile people in order to target Gillard. This often involves some pretty low attacks on her character. He would also attempt to undermine the government's response to the global financial crisis by criticising the debt it was taking on in order to keep our nation out of recession, as well as attempting to block policies aimed at keeping the Australian economy in the green. Despite Abbott's terrible policies, he would benefit from a dysfunctional Labour Party and a biased media to force a minority government in 2010, and later an electoral victory in 2013. This emboldened Abbott to take a metaphorical sledgehammer to the previous government's policies, killing the smooth transition of power Australia had benefited from for the last four decades. As a result, Australians soon found themselves very turned off from Abbott, as he brought forward a policy agenda that felt more out of the 1950s than 2010s. Such policies include the reintroduction of night and damehoods, ensuring that Australia would be one of the last developed countries to legalise same-sex marriages, as well as taking fears around non-white immigration via his boat people policies. Abbott would also abolish the Labour government's money and carbon taxes, killing major revenue streams and ensuring that we would not hit a budget surplus for at least another decade. This poor economic policy was laid bare in the horrific 2014 budget which featured cuts to multiple sectors, hitting regular Australians hard and arguably contributing to the economic stagnation that persists to this day. He also vastly overhauled the NBN to bring us the much inferior fibre to the node proposal, which has seen Australia's internet speed fall behind the rest of the developed world. He would also destroy government's accountability when he refused to sack House Speaker Bronwyn Bishop over the Choppergate scandal. This is also coupled with the growth in government corruption, which again still persists to this day. Luckily, I wasn't the only one who couldn't tolerate Abbott's terrible leadership, as by the end of 2015, Australia was ready to vote the Abbott government out of power after only one term. 
In response, the Liberal Party would finally move to sack Abbott before the 2016 election. Despite no longer being our Prime Minister, I still feel like Abbott's legacy persists to this day, with our government continuing to be much further to the right than the average Australian, while also not being accountable. It's this dark legacy that continues to keep Abbott relevant even after his departure from Canberra, as we are in most respects still living under his leadership. Going over to my patrons, we have ARW who says, Tony Abbott gained prominence as a strident conservative minister in the Howard government, attracting support from powerful sectors of the right wing while being almost universally despised by the left. In a country where most leaders are known for their pragmatism, Abbott was and continues to be largely identified by his unabashed and inflexible conservatism. This served him well as opposition leader, in which he opposed the majority of the Rudd Gillard's policy initiatives and especially benefited when both their governments became plagued by internal dysfunction, allowing him to lead the Liberal Party back into power at the 2013 election. His standing among the electorate quickly diminished as he attempted to implement budget measures in 2014 that were unnecessarily punitive. With Australians from all walks of life expressing opposition to them, few of those measures were able to pass the Senate, and Abbott's refusal to negotiate with the minor parties demonstrated the limits of his inflexible approach to politics. While he fulfilled election commitments such as repealing the carbon tax and curbing illegal immigration, these decisions went against expert opinion on the retrospective topics of climate change and immigration and merely reflected the toxic political debate of these issues that the right-wing politicians such as Abbott had deliberately stoked for their own political advantage. Abbott's brand of conservatism did run contrary to the mainstream Australian's opinion at the time, such as his widely ridiculed reintroduction of knighthoods and opposition to same-sex marriage, which was proven to be the minority by the 2017 postal vote. But aside from his inflexible ideological positions, Abbott simply didn't seem competent in the role of Prime Minister. While a convincing communicator went on the offensive, most notably in Parliament, he was absolutely hopeless at defending himself in press conferences, television interviews and instances where he had to think off the top of his head. The best example of this was when asked by Lee Sales on 7.30 to highlight an economic achievement of his government, he responded with I stopped the boats. As his government wore on, his ministers increasingly leaked their discontent to the media leading up to the events of September 2015, when longtime adversary Malcolm Turnbull ousted him to become Prime Minister himself. Abbott languished on the backbench until the centrist independent Alice de Gaulle defeated him in his own electorate in the 2019 election, though to his credit he did accept that particular defeat gracefully. Overall, Tony Abbott contributed significantly to the much dysfunctional that plagued Australia's policy in the 2010s, and by the time he left, I really don't think he's left the country in a better place than he found it. Tony Abbott will likely be remembered fondly by the Liberal Party for his achievement in returning them to office in just six years, but will go down in history overall as one of the lesser Prime Ministers in Australian history, and that's being generous. We also have James Rapp, who says, Tony Abbott is the perfect example of someone who was made for opposition, and not for government. As opposition leader, Abbott was incredibly effective at holding the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government to account and making gains amongst disaffected voters. This was achieved through a combination of relentless negativity and carefully crafted three-letter slogans that always made the nightly news, Stop the Boats and Axe the Tax comes to mind. This aggressive top-down leadership style was proven disastrous when he became Prime Minister. Instead of enacting a positive, sensible agenda for the nation, Abbott dedicated his time in office to destroying the legacy of the previous government. Abbott ruined the biggest opportunity of a generation, the NBN, with his more expensive yet inferior plan. He got rid of the only functional climate policy this nation had had up to date. His budget was cruel and out of touch and poorly marketed. Abbott's bullish foreign policy approach made Australians feel less safe at home and more embarrassed about our place in the world. Ultimately, by the time he was removed from office, he had alienated just about every group in the country. I have no doubt that had Abbott led the coalition to the 2016 election, they would have likely become a one-term government. Tony Abbott is many things, a man of faith, a passionate member of the community, and an uncompromising conservative, but he will ultimately go down in history as one of the worst Prime Ministers Australia ever had. We also have Miriam H, who says, His government set us back a few good steps in terms of social and economic progress. As a big techie, ruining the NBN was one of his biggest mistakes in the history of the country. We are now wasting so much money to fix his, and later Turnbull's, mistakes. His budget cuts also really hurt Australians, both rich and poor, breaking election promises he had made including promising not to introduce said cuts. Debt also massively increased under his government, blaming Labor for said spike in debt instead of his own economic policies. He was also hyper fixated on union corruption, wasting time in the Royal Commissions, when it found next to nothing in the Royal Commission. His government also embarrassed Australia diplomatically, for example, his approach towards Russia during MH17. Going over to YouTube, we also have EF, who says, Abbott was absolutely horrific. Archaic social views, damaging economic views, and the breaking of a number of election promises, not to mention the disgusting behaviour towards Julia Gillard. Some PMs are bad because they're incompetent, like Turnbull. Others are bad because their policies are bad, like Howard. Tony Abbott manages to be both. 
horrible policies and incompetence all in one package. Australia's political discourse was far worse because of him, we are far better now that he's gone. I know this is a very biased answer, but I truly can't think of a way to portray him positively. With someone like Howard, you can criticise him while still acknowledging that he deserves respect and praise for his political ability. I have no respect for Tony Abbott, and doubt I ever will, he's just that bad. We also have Mormon Buffalo, who says, Tony Abbott is possibly one of the most hated Prime Ministers in Australian history, with his extreme religious beliefs, outdated views on immigration, and his ignorance on climate change. While Malcolm Turnbull is treated in the same, maybe even a little worse than Abbott, at the end of the day, Turnbull is just more appealing than that mad monk. Also, his onion eating style is interesting. I think my audience is in solid agreement that Abbott was a pretty terrible Prime Minister. Perhaps that notion would be challenged if some of my more conservative viewers decided to voice their opinions for this video, but alas, that was not the case. For those who liked Tony Abbott and made it to the end of this video, let me say a few positives about the man. Reading up on his history, Abbott seems like a pretty decent bloke. His commitment to his Christian faith is admirable, as well as his commitment to charities and public service. In the 2019 bushfires, he actively fought on the front lines against the flames. Such an act made without any political benefit shows that Abbott does indeed have a solid moral consciousness, even if that did not show up much during his time as PM. Now, I want to apologise again about how long these videos take to come out. With the federal election on at the moment, I've been quite preoccupied with modern politics to cover historic politics, but I'll try to get the next episode in the series done as quickly as possible. So be sure to put your Malcolm Turnbull takes in either the comment section of this video or on my Patreon if you want to see it featured in the next video. So until then, I'll see you later.